we've got to start to create new predictable patterns. In other words, things that are occurring in a predictable way, the same day and the same time of the week that we, can, we used to. See, for many of us, for maybe most of us as Christians, Sunday has been the only predictable pattern that we've had when it comes to our spiritual life. But for many and more people, that's broken, that's changed. And so even if you've shifted to online streaming and videos, it's not the same predictable pattern it was. And I wanna say that first and foremost, we gotta start thinking, what are the new predictable patterns in life that we need to create? Welcome to the Everyday Disciple Podcast, where you'll learn how to live with greater intentionality and an integrated faith that naturally fits into every area of life. In other words, discipleship as a lifestyle. This is the stuff your parents, pastors, and seminary professors probably forgot to tell you. And now, here's your host, Caesar Kalinowski. All righty, as always, it's good to be with you. I hope your week is starting off well. I don't know if you're hearing this at the beginning of the week when I, you know, we drop the episodes every Monday. When you wake up, it's there waiting for you. If you subscribed, wink, wink. Or if you're hearing this later in the week or maybe on the weekend or maybe you took me to the gym with you or on a walk. I appreciate that. What are you looking at right now? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm having a great week and I'm excited as always to be uh, a part of this great kingdom and get to live this life that Jesus created for us to live as disciples who make disciples. It's amazing. Uh, as always, I want to invite you to join us on Facebook. Join us in that community. Uh, we're in there talking about discipleship and how the gospel applies to everyday life and all of that. You can join us over there at everydaydisciple.com forward slash Facebook. Or just when you're in Facebook kicking around, just do a little search for Everyday Disciple and you'll find us, okay? And I would love for you to subscribe to the show so you don't miss episodes. So it's always in your feed. And when you're like going, hey, what do I want to listen to today? You're like, oh yeah, my new Everyday Disciple podcast in there. So if you've not done that, would you go ahead and do that? Whatever platform, tool, you know, uh, whatever you're listening on, would you go ahead and just subscribe? And then I don't know if people are doing this very often, but I would love if you would leave a review, you know, leave some stars and an honest, short little review. We are growing as a podcast, more and more listeners every month, praise God. And um, but we've not been getting in a whole lot of uh, you know reviews and stuff lately. So you know, could you just you want to bless me back <laughs> and bless others that help put the show together? Would you would you just go ahead and subscribe? But then go ahead and and leave a review. All right, leave a review for us. I'd really appreciate. It. I know from looking at our analytics that there are a lot of people who are listening on their phones, and a lot a lot of y'all are listening through devices where you can do that. So please do. I hope you will. All right, appreciate that. All right, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to start shifting your church outward. Okay, and maybe you're going like, yeah, it already did. <laughs> After you know the Corona thing hit, uh, it just sort of did shift outward, and the church is people, so we're out there, obviously, right? But the organized aspect of our church is it happening? Is it out there? You know, I I think around 30, 33 percent of regular faithful church attenders have not yet come back to a Sunday gathering, and it's looking like they're not going to. That they're choosing to try to be the church. You know, more in their own lives and at home and all that. And I, I want to call us as leaders and as Christians to say, well, okay, if that's what's happened, it's happening, right? This might be the best thing that's happened in a long time, but we don't have to then just throw up our hands and abdicate. I think we can still encourage and guide and equip, obviously. And that's what I want to talk about today. So if you're leading a church or part of a church, or maybe you're part of that percentage that says, I don't know if I'm starting to go back on Sundays, I want to talk about, you know, what are some real basic initial steps that I'd suggest taking to start shifting your church to be the church more out there and with an outward focus as well. So not just detached from a centralized gathering, which you know, we're hoping we still get to do, right, obviously, in increasing ways, but being the church in everyday life and with a more outward focus. And so I get asked all the time, like, what, you know, like, what would you do? What are the first few things you would do? And um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I want to talk about today. And I think that um, some of the fears that people face, and maybe you, maybe you face these fears as well, is um, 
you know, as leaders, like, I, I, I don't know how to lead them out there. I was sort of taught and trained and got pretty good at doing this in here in the church building, right? And so um, these are going to apply to you today. This is going to help you start and model new rhythms and practices. And these things are just the beginning. They're not everything, but they're, again, as I've been asked many, many times, how would you start? What are some of the very first things you do? And, you know, people ask, like, what am I actually inviting people out there in my church into? <laughs> like, if, if I'm trying to help equip them out there to be more outward focused and out on mission, what am I inviting them to, right? And so, by the way, before I forget, and I'm going to dive right in, I'm going to give you five simple sort of beginning steps today. But I want to let you know that we have just opened up a couple coaching cohorts, okay, uh, starting this fall here real soon. And uh, Tina and I coach couples, and we, we teach and train on how to live this life and then how to equip others to do the same. Make disciples who make disciples, starting as families, in community, and then multiplying out as communities and all that, right? And so we're opening up an opportunity to work with two teams of couples from the same church or organization and we want to have you together in a cohort with us so you can gain the insight and frameworks and tools and help to successfully establish new outward-focused discipleship rhythms in all of life. And so if you're interested in coaching, period, or if you are interested in being one of those two teams that we're going to coach together so you kind of own this as a church and or as a network or whatever, either way, go ahead and go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching and uh, read all about it. I got a little video there explaining some things, and then there's a, just a little sort of form on there, nothing big, just a little form. Tell me a little bit about yourself, and uh, and we can hop on a Zoom call, and, and maybe, maybe you can get one of those two slots that we're going to open up to work with the teams, all right? So um, there again, you can go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching and check that out. All right, so here I go. Here's here's uh, the five things that I think I would get going right away to start, you know, uh, moving and shifting folks in your church, in your own life, more outward, okay? The first one is we've got to start to create new predictable patterns. Yeah, new predictable patterns. In other words, things that are occurring in a predictable way, the same day and the same time of the week that we, can, we used to. See, for many of us, for maybe most of us as Christians, Sunday has been the only predictable pattern that we've had when it came comes to our spiritual life. But for many and more people, that's broken. That's changed. And so even if you've shifted to online streaming and videos, it's not the same predictable pattern it was. And I want to say that first and foremost, we've got to start thinking, what are the new predictable patterns in life that we need to create? So often when we start something new, or we want to make a suggestion to people, or even in our own lives and families, we kind of do them as one-offs. And so people go like, you know, I saw this thing on the internet, or I heard Caesar talking a few podcasts back about, you know, he's doing driveway happy hours, or people are doing ice cream socials, and I have some friends that are doing their own little sort of mini Oktoberfest, and you're like, oh, I'm going to do that. And those are good things, but they're like one-offs, and we we build some relationship, we make some maybe some new friends, and then we don't see people for months and months and months again. This is so key to anything when it comes to making disciples is and creating new rhythms and discipleship relationships and all that is we need to create predictable patterns. So if, for instance, you're doing an open table night or a happy hour or you're going to have a brunch on the week, whatever, you want to have it where people can count on it. You ever been to a restaurant that's like just not open out of the blue and you're like, what's going on? Like, oh, we're not open Mondays. You're like, well, why not? And then you, you know, you say, all right. And then next time you come back and you're like, it's Wednesday. We're not, oh yeah, we switched. We used to be, you know, it's right. You can just go forget it. Well, it's the same thing in relationships. People need to understand and get used to a predictable pattern. And then they start to shift their own schedule, their own calendars to fit that type of thing. So for instance, when we are doing like a weekly barbecue or something like that in our life, we're going to pick the same day of the week and the same time, and we're going to do it regardless if anybody's coming or not. We're just doing it. And we're going to let people know, and we're going to remind them. And what will happen is, you know, you always get a few, uh, but other people go like, oh, I totally forgot. I can't believe it. Like, you're doing it again? Yep. Still doing it at the same time next week. Yeah. Can't, you know, can't wait to see you. And they'll forget again, but eventually they'll start going like, hey, it's Friday. What's going on? What's going on? And so it's really key not to do one-off little shotgun approaches of sort of missional outreach activities or whatever we want to call them. 
We really need to establish predictable patterns. And I think today, given what's changed, and for most people, what we're doing is we're creating new predictable patterns. All right? So here's my second sort of insight and suggestion for you. This would be probably the first predictable pattern I would want to introduce. And that would be, and I would do this like church-wide. So if you're leading, I would like make this a thing. Um, I would I would help my people start to have a family dinner night that's really special. Like really, just them and their own family. Like there, there's seven nights a week that they probably have an opportunity to have dinner. And most people do not take advantage of that or make it special or make it intentional at all. That's my experience. Tina and I are always blown away at how many people tell us, like, I yeah, we don't really eat. Like, everybody just kind of grabs stuff, and we sit in front of the TV, the kids go, oh, whatever. It's like, no, at least let's start having one a week that's a family dinner night that's special, and we're going to start to learn and model certain things together. And I would do this church-wide. Like, I'd make it kind of a thing, right? A good friend of mine, Bryce, who leads a, a church, he pastors up in, in North Dakota, they did this church-wide. They kind of made it a thing for, like, I think they said, hey, for the next eight weeks, every family in the church, we're going to have one special family dinner night, and you're going to sit down with your own family and look into each other's eyes, and we're going to give you some resources and some help and some suggestions on how to make it awesome. And that's what they did, and it was really cool. And what it did was it started to create a new predictable pattern within those family units that would give them something maybe that would be a model for what they might later do in community, right? But instead of saying like, hey, go out and start doing all these things with your neighbors, <laughs> right? And we're like, oh, I can't even do that right now, you know? Like, they're not even allowed to, or I don't, my heart's not ready for that. Hey, let's start doing it as a family and start to interact in certain ways where the kingdom of God shows up and grace is established and spoken and experienced and all that. And uh, let's let's start a new predictable pattern as a church where, you know what, all of our families, they all have at least one really special family dinner night. And we're not talking about just we eat together. There's a bunch of cool stuff you can do together to make it awesome. And like, like I said, sort of become a model for what you might start to do out in community. Okay, so um, you may have heard we did an episode a little ways back. It was episode number 273 called, uh, you know, how to have amazing family dinner nights. So you can Google that up, <laughs> you'll find it, or scroll back in your feed, but how to have amazing family dinner nights, and, and I get into a, a lot of steps and how to do it, and a lot of our tips and tricks, and uh, I think you're going to dig it, all right? That's the second thing. So create predictable patterns, and that start having a family dinner night, and, and really lead your church to say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to start being like a family so that we can include more people in the family, see, and, and help them do that. Second thing, here's a third thing. It's another church-wide thing, is I would encourage people to have one dinner per week, just one out of seven. So they're doing they're doing one now that's a family dinner night. They were already doing probably something like this, but now that's intentional. But now this is a different night. One dinner per week with a not yet believing friend or neighbor. So a non-Christian friend or neighbor. And just say, you know what? Like we're gonna pick a night as a family or as a couple, maybe you don't have kids at home or whatever. Um we're going we're gonna to have one night a week, and we're going to pray about it, and we're going to just lock it in the calendar, and we're going to start having a not-yet-believing friend over. If, if a whole church did this, okay, if a whole church did this, and just as believers who live their faith and know the gospel um, started doing this, not with any, like, okay, then when you get them over, like, like pull out a bunch of tracks and really hammer them and all that. No, just have them over to love on them to show them grace, to model and glorify our Father, what he's like, right? The love of the Father and Jesus and what it's like to be in a family that loves people, <laughs> right, and is full of grace. And, and, and I think if a whole church, like, was to, to like, say, hey, you know, we're going to commit to that. We're going to give it, you know, we're going to give it one night a week. We're eating anyway, right? So it's, there's nothing to add. We're going to do one night a week, and everybody's going to have a not-yet-believing friend or couple over. And then what I would do is I would give time at your gathering, if you're, if you're gathering, right, or even online, and I would give time for stories from those dinners, <laughs> right? I would let people from your church 
tell little stories of like, well, okay, so this week we had this one guy over, like he seems like the real grumpy guy in the neighborhood, and he we couldn't even believe it. He said, yeah, I'll come on over, and we did a little something outside on the deck and everything, and you wouldn't even believe where it went, right? And I would tell, you know, one or two stories a week, and maybe this is something you make into a series. There again, like the family dinner night, maybe you're going to really promote the heck out of it and equip people, um, and you're going to do it over a series of weeks as a community, as a church, maybe you do this like the same way. And so every week while you're sort of talking about it, or you just feature it for like six or eight weeks. Hey, you know, we're all doing this. We're doing this sort of a, like an open table kind of thing. We're going to have, but we're just making it real simple because, you know, COVID now and all that. One person or family that's not yet believer over every week, just a different person. We're going to check it out. Do you think that the evangelistic fruit in that church or community would go up a little? (laughs) You bet it would. It'd be crazy. Like, and often, when pe- you know, there again, when people have asked me, like, what's the very first thing you do? Let's start moving your church towards discipleship and mission as a lifestyle. This is usually where I said I would start. I would really encourage people. And I, you have to model it as leaders, right? But I'd start having one dinner per week with a not-yet-believing friend or neighbor, and it would, like just high invitation, meaning come on, low challenge. I'm not trying to get you saved or get you to say a prayer. Just I want to get to know you, get to know your story, know more about you. I want to share our life and story. See if, see if there's a connection, right? And that leads right into the fourth thing that I, I would do to start shifting people more outward is I would begin to teach your people how to identify their own unique people of peace, okay? Their own unique people of peace. Those people of peace, as we use the term, are those people in your life that once you meet them and they've met you maybe, you know, more than once or two or three times, sometimes it's pretty quick, um, they kind of, they're leaning into relationship, right? You've, you've heard me talk about this. People of peace are those people like, you kind of pronounce peace in their life, like, hey, it's, like, it's good to see you. And I'm like, oh, I love the way you're doing that. Or, you're such a good mom with your, with your kids. Wow, I really want to encourage you. So you kind of bless them or you invite them over, right? See how this fits into the third step that we just did one not yet believing friend or neighbor a week and you're looking for people of peace like hey who seems to be like leaning in like man they're like when can we do this again and and i'd like to have you over they want to serve you back right if if everybody in the church let's just capital c church in in the world okay or in your country i live in america right most of the people listening to this today probably do live in the u.s but wherever you live just think about it. like okay how many people are in the church If every Christian, everybody who claims Christ, was to identify one person in their life that is a person of peace, meaning it's not like, oh, that's a hard rock to break. No, this is a person who likes me. They know my faith. They still are interested in who we are. They want to hang out. If we could identify one person of peace each and start to hang out with them more and invite them into a life in Christ with us, we just doubled the church tomorrow. And think about it, where the church is all flipping out right now, pulling out their hair like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, everything's changed, a lot of churches have closed, 30-something percent of people aren't coming back, da, da, da. Well, I'm giving you some really basic, simple steps here. And if you want to double, <laughs> you want to double things? Now, I know we only count people if they show up at our service, but wait a second, if the mission is make disciples of Jesus, teaching them how to walk in my ways so that they'll come to know the truth and be set free, right? Helping people move from unbelief to belief in the gospel in every area of life, that's how we define discipleship, then that counts. (laughs) That counts, right? In other words, everybody in our church identifies one person apiece, just one, and I know God's already got them for you. We've just doubled effectively, and there's like no problem with what's going on. And you know what? It didn't have to happen at a, at a building. Do you see how this is all kind of starting to fit together, right? Create new predictable patterns. Churchwide, I'd start helping equip people and encouraging them like crazy to have one special family dinner night a week. Churchwide, I'd also encourage people, and maybe you do this a few weeks later after they've established their dinner night, you know, family dinner night, start having another night where you have one not yet believing friend or neighbor over. I mean, you're doing them anyway. You're eating 21 meals a week, and maybe it's not dinner. Maybe it's lunch. You know, maybe you choose to do it at breakfast. It doesn't matter. Or, or oh, we're going to do dessert once a week. That's fine too, right? And then start to learn how and equip your people on how to identify their own unique people of peace. Now, I don't have time to go into exactly how you do that. We have exhaustive teaching and training on that, and we coach and equip to that like crazy. But if you go to episode 222, it's called Where to Find Your People of Peace. Just search that up. Just put in Everyday Disciple Podcast in Google, Where to Find Your People of Peace, or just 
Everyday Disciple Podcast, People of Peace. It'll pop up. I, I, I'm sure it will. And that, that'll go deep then into uniquely, how do you find your people of peace? And you can you can share that with the people in your church. You can encourage them to listen to that and give it a shot. You could d- dis, you know, distill that into your own teaching sermons or whatever. I don't know, right? But that's a key thing because that starts to take what we're doing and starts to turn it outward. And then we still look for those unique people of peace that God's going to call us to do life with. And then that leads me to my fifth sort of simple little step that kind of wraps around all of them is then once you've identified those people of peace, either just from your neighborhood or maybe hanging out at a local pub or gym, whatever, you want to start to invite those people of peace into your family's predictable patterns and rhythms. But even if it's just your family dinner night and you have a, a regular night of the week that you have not yet believing friends and stuff over, you want to then, once you've identified those people of peace, you want to start to invite them into your family's predictable patterns and rhythms. And not just your family dinner night or maybe that, you know, that special dinner night, but what's other predictable patterns that you do as a family? Think If you sit and think about it, talk about it tonight at dinner, I'll bet you'll find that you've got quite a few predictable patterns. Some of them are really fun. Some of them seem very mundane, like, you know, we work in the yard most weekends, or once a month at least, we're, you know, we're pulling weeds, we're raking, we're planting some flowers, we're trimming up some stuff. You invite your people a piece to do that stuff with you, have a simple lunch or something, trust me, they will, because that's what it means to be a person of peace. They want to hang out with you. And then you say, hey... This was blast. How about we, next Saturday, we go to your house and knock out a bunch of gardening. And it'll be really fun that way because I hate just sitting here in silence and ripping out these weeds by myself and trying to get the kids to do it. How about we do it together? And then we'll have a lunch again, right? So start to invite your people of peace into your family's predictable patterns and rhythms. Now, there is a whole lot more to do (laughs) yet to fully embrace discipleship and mission as a lifestyle. And certainly, growing in your gospel fluency so that you can speak and live and enjoy the good news of the gospel in all of life, as families and as the church and with others, that's going to be a big part of where you'll need to learn and grow, okay? So that everything you're doing, all these simple little things we've talked about today are just increasingly filled up with good news. I'm not talking about preaching or chapter and verse in people. I'm talking about a fluency of the gospel where we can speak the good news to everybody's bad news problems in life, right? Uh, That's going to be a big part of this. But with all that we've experienced and with the breakdown of the Sunday gathering as our primary predictable pattern, it really is time to start establishing new rhythms that will lead to new outward-focused lives and relationships for the sake of the gospel and discipleship. Remember, that's the only mission Jesus gave us. Go and make disciples. He didn't say when it's convenient or if you have a building. Remember, he never did that. We can't find that in the early church. They they weren't setting up church buildings and services like that, right? So clearly, with that same power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that dwelt in the early church, we can make disciples who make disciples. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, but go and make, right? But go and make, but I'll be there with you. That's our mission, and I don't know how long it's going to be until things get back to, you know, what we thought it was or whatever, but I've said on many episodes of the podcast in the last six months since the pandemic hit, I'm kind of grateful for God shaking us up. Like, maybe this pandemic's not happening to us, but it's happening for us, family, and so I, I for one, I just, I'm advocating, don't just throw up your hands. And do your best to encourage your people to do little mini church services at home. Let's start to establish new outward predictable patterns, new outward rhythms, right? That's that's what we get to do. Like, we, we want to be the church that's out there because we are out there. <laughs> but we want to do it with intention, and that intention is to make disciples of Jesus, filling the world with him, with Jesus, with God's glory, okay? Now, as always, I want to leave you with the big three takeaways from today's topic, from what we've been talking about. So uh, if nothing else, you don't want to miss miss these. Um, These are the big three sort of, okay, if you don't miss this, right? And as always, you can get a printable PDF of this week's big three, where you can just print off a PDF of of these. As a free download, all you have to do is go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. Okay, everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three. And here you go. Here's your big three for today. First, Your family 
is the first place to begin when starting new spiritual rhythms. Begin at the beginning in your own lives. Trying to organize others into a series of activities and events or new rhythms that you and those closest to you are not already living, that'll only produce unnecessary stress, and it's going to set you up for failure. And you know what? This is especially important for pastors and leaders. Live as a family worth joining and imitating, and start making space in your schedule and in your hearts for others to join you. Second, God loves you just where you're at. I want to remind you that. Like Some of you are going to hear this and go, oh, this sounds so simple and so good, and, but I have conviction right away. Right? I just want to remind you, you are loved. God loves you right where you're at. But our Father did not send his Son, Jesus, just to get us into heaven. He came that we might have a full life. Right? I came that you might have life and life to the full. An adventure with him of being his disciples and making more disciples. Starting first in our families with our own kids, our own church, and then moving outward towards others. This is the life that God created us for. It really was. Jesus didn't die that we might sit in rows in silence once a week or now watch a streaming thing and then get back to life, right? This is the life we were created for and that Jesus died to give us. Will you embrace it? Will you help others on the journey embrace this as well, both believers and not yet? (laughs) I hope so. And then third, I really want to encourage you to get the training that you need to get started to move outward, to stay on mission, to, you know, to live this way and to start to make disciples in everyday life. I I want you to, don't get stuck, right? A life of spiritual freedom and relational peace awaits you, but it is far too easy to, you know, to hear a talk like this and give some mental assent, like, yep, yep, just nod sort of in agreement, you know, yep, we got to try that someday, Uh, but then never really get started with new meaningful practices. I don't want that for you. And we would love to help. Like I said at the top of the show, we are just starting a couple, you know, not a lot of slots, but coaching cohorts right now for couples. Tina and I coach couples as couples so that it's a family-based thing and moves outward. And and that's both just normal folks and pastors and leaders within the church. And we are opening up an opportunity to work with two teams of couples from the same church or maybe organization or network to be in a cohort together together. So you can gain the insights and frameworks, have the same language and tools and moving forward. That kind of multiplies it. So we're opening up two spots for unique cohorts of teams, basically, teams of couples from the same church or organization. So either way, if you're interested in coaching as couples or you'd like to see if you can, you know, before they're gone, grab one of those two slots for a team, you know, of like five, six, seven, eight, whatever couples, um, go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching. Okay, everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching, and you can get a lot more information on, on what we're doing and what you'll gain and how it works. And then there's just a short little form you can fill out, and it'll send it to me. We'll hop on a Zoom call, and I'll answer all your questions and see if we can get you started, okay, and keep you going. All right? Well, hey, this has been a blast. I hope this is helpful. I hope these five small little steps give you encouragement to start to live and help others in, in your church move outward but in really simple ways. Okay, so I hope you have a great week. I can't wait to talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us today. For more information on this show and to get loads of free discipleship resources, visit everydaydisciple.com. And remember, you really can live with the spiritual freedom and relational peace that Jesus promised every day.